Um, so for this session, uh, we're joined by Mari Margil, who's the Executive Director for the Center of Democratic and Environmental Rights. She's been working on advancing the rights of nature uh, across the world, including uh, in Ecuador, which was the first national constitution, with the rights of nature being recognized. Uh, and in this session, she's going to introduce us to the rights of nature movement, tracing the origins uh, until today, and kind of looking both at smaller communities as well as uh, on a national level. And it will include how we can also protect ecosystems and species, which includes peatlands, of course, uh, and how this may represent a necessary and fundamental shift with our relationship as humankind towards the natural world. Uh, so, Mary, I'll hand over to you if you want to say a few other words of introduction. Or just Thanks. Thank you, Bethany and Bianca, um, for hosting this session today and to Oki and everybody at Repeat, it's really nice to be able to participate in this Peat Fest 2022. Um, my task today has been essentially to provide an introduction, um, as Bethany said, to what is the rights of nature. Um, and so we have a presentation um, that we'll give, and then we're gonna open it up for conversation um, and questions and answers and just see where it goes. Um, so, I'm Mari Margill with the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. My organization and my colleagues have been working on establishing rights of nature laws um, in different parts of the world. Um, and we're gonna walk through some of that to get a sense of how this movement has built since the first rights of nature law was enacted in 2006 to where we are today. Um, and I wanted to finish with beginning to think about what does it mean if peatlands are recognized as possessing legal rights. So essentially, I wanted to walk through sort of the very basics of the rights of nature, what it is, why it's happening, where is it happening, and where we can go from here. Um, so to begin, um, the question is, what is the rights of nature? Um, and the rights of nature is oh is that going down for you uh no 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 okay hold on let me see how i can move this uh there we go so what is the rights of nature very simply the rights of nature is found what's recognizing legal rights of the natural world either through a law or through a court ruling and that means the recognition within a law passed at a national level, subnational level, local level, or a court at a national level or a lower level, recognizing that all of nature or a particular species or a particular ecosystem such as a river possesses legal rights. That's it. It's a very basic idea that nature is being recognized and protected by certain rights. And in thinking about why rights, and I know that's been part of the conversation already at the conference, legal rights are the highest form of protection that we have in our human written laws. And so that's why when you talk about rights, you often talk about them as constitutional. As mentioned, Ecuador has recognized the constitutional rights of nature. But you also find that rights can be secured in other forms of law as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But importantly, the rights of nature is about recognizing particular rights to the whole of nature, to a species, to an ecosystem, and that these rights become the highest form of protection that nature holds. And these rights can include sort of that basic right to exist, and that nature has the right to even be, other rights that have been recognized for nature within laws, within court rulings, include the right to thrive or flourish, the right of nature to regenerate so that it can bring itself back to a healthy state should it experience some sort of injury or harm, the right of nature to evolve. So everything evolves um, and interfering with that, which has happened um, because of human action. If nature has a right to evolve, it means it has a right to behave in its natural way without human interference the right to perform natural functions. So what does it mean for nature to have the right to perform its natural functions? Well, if you think about a river, for instance, as an ecosystem recognizes possessing legal rights, if an, 
river is performing its natural functions in a healthy way, it means a lot more than just water flowing through a riverbed. It means that it's providing habitat, for instance, for different aquatic creatures like fish. It means it's providing sustenance to the different uh, species that depend upon it, fish, other aquatic creatures, others that depend on that water. Um, it's providing a whole series of natural functions um, that a river provides that's a lot more than just water flowing downstream. And so there's a whole, it's a holistic understanding of a river, for instance, or a forest or another ecosystem being able to perform the functions that it naturally would without human interference. So those are some of the rights that have been recognized within law and in court rulings. Other rights include the right to restoration. So if there is harm to an ecosystem or to a species or nature on the whole, that nature has a right to be restored fully and completely to bring it back to its pre-damaged state. A right to clean water. I mentioned rivers. It doesn't do a whole lot of good for a river not to have clean, fresh water um, if it's to provide a healthy ecosystem, habitat, sustenance to all of the species and other ecosystems that depend upon it. So a right to clean water is integral to the health and well-being, for instance, of a river, but of course, to every ecosystem on Earth. The right to a healthy climate system. Um, I know for folks participating from Europe, United States, elsewhere, this has been um, a time of great climate change, heat um, in different parts of the world, drought, flooding, all of this we know is being accelerated and catalyzed by climate change. A healthy climate system is needed by species and ecosystems as well as ourselves for us to be healthy and thriving. Um, and so a right to a healthy climate system has also been a right recognized um, for certain parts of nature within law. And then of course, a right to habitat. So if you think about a species, it's awfully difficult for a species to be healthy and thriving if they don't have the habitat that they need in order to be healthy and thriving. Habitat that they live in, that they reside in, that they depend upon for their raising their young, um, being able to protect themselves, to be able to gain the kind of sustenance food that they need to be healthy and thriving. So these are examples of even like the most basic rights of nature that have been recognized within different laws in different parts of the world. But there are other rights as well, like clean air, for instance. So these basic rights beginning with that most basic right of all, which is the right of nature to even exist. So when we think about these rights, they, they really form the core, the heart, if you will, of any rights of nature law or court ruling that recognizes that nature possesses legal rights. And so the key elements of a rights of nature law, um, as you see in different parts of the world, again, uh, at the most national level, in a constitution such as in Ecuador, national statute, or even in local community laws. The heart of these laws are these rights, rights to exist, thrive, regenerate, evolve, be restored. The second piece is the ability to enforce these rights. It doesn't mean a whole lot to have a right if you're not able to exercise it, to defend it if it's being interfered or infringed, and being able to enforce it against those who seek or are interfering with your ability to even exist, for instance. So enforcement means that in these laws that nature itself can bring a case on its own behalf to stop harm, to stop an infringement of its legal rights. So an ecosystem, for instance, or a species, as we'll talk about, being able to defend and enforce its own rights. That's a central piece of a lot of rights of nature laws. And in addition, that people who reside in a place the government that governs that place, or even a designated guardian or trustee has the ability to step into the shoes of nature. So for instance, step in the shoes of a river, literally, but also in a courtroom, to be able to be there to represent nature's legal rights. So not the rights of the human being or the government, but the right of nature itself, the species, the ecosystem as the rights holder it possesses legal rights, and it needs to be able to exercise and enforce and defend these rights. We'll talk a little bit a bit more about that. So recognition of rights that's central to any rights of nature law, the ability to exercise or enforce that, that enforcement of rights critical to any rights of nature law. And then finally, another piece to this 
is implementing those rights. And that means government in particular guaranteeing that those rights will not be interfered with or infringed. And when we talk about implementation, that might sound strange. We, under, we can sort of get our minds around this idea of, well, if someone's interfering with my rights, I can maybe go to court to try to stop that, to defend my rights. But in terms of implementation, it's sort of the other side of that coin. So in places, for instance, like Ecuador, where we continue to do work, implementation means building in, for instance, to their national environmental law that governs all sorts of permitting or licensing of corporate or industrial kinds of activities, that they have to build in criteria into their decision making to ensure that any action that the government is licensing or authorizing, that it upholds, it guarantees the rights of nature, that any decision that they make to license a new mine, for instance, that that mine cannot interfere with the rights of nature. So that good decisions are being made so that we're not always, and within environmental advocacy, I think it often feels like we're always trying to stop bad things from going on or trying to mitigate the harm that has been occurred from some sort of industrial corporate activity. With rights of nature, we're trying to stop those things from even happening, stop them from ever even being authorized. It's about a real shift in our thinking, but also our governing, so that we're making good decisions, so that our decision making within our governments, with us as people, are about how do we ensure that nature remains robust and healthy and resilient. So we're not trying to stop the bad thing from happening after it's happened, that we're trying to ensure that good things are happening, that we're actually moving into a restorative, sustainable, harmonious relationship with the natural world where we just haven't been. So those are essentially the three key elements, but other pieces as well go into rights of nature laws, that recognition of rights, the ability to enforce those rights, and the ability to implement those rights. And so the question from here often is, well, why do this at all? Why do we need rights of nature? So why rights of nature? The first rights of nature laws and the laws that have subsequently been adopted and even by courts ruling have come about because there's a growing frustration, a growing, if you will, dissatisfaction with existing conventional today's environmental laws. These laws have done a very poor job of protecting the environment. Under today's environmental laws, which you see in countries all over the world, you know, in, in the United States where I live, we have laws like a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act. Those laws treat nature as an it, as a thing, as a commodity or property. It, nature does not even possess the basic right to exist under these laws. What these laws are doing is authorizing the use of nature, the exploitation of nature. And so, as we see on this slide, environmental laws legalize environmental harm. So what do we mean by that? Well, that means, for instance, uh, fracking for gas or oil is occurring all over the world. That's not something that's occurring, you know, corporations just going ahead and doing it without license by government. They're actually licensed, authorized by the government to do it under environmental laws. So they're authorized to use millions of gallons at fresh water at every frack well. They're authorized to contaminate millions of gallons of fresh water at every frack well. They're being given the legal authority to cause explosions in the grounds that can cause earthquakes and rupture aquifers and all sorts of other kinds of environmental harm. We have other activities, um, you know, in the United States, wetland filling, that means a existing wetland being drained and filled in with dirt or soil to be built upon, that filling that they call it wetlands or peatlands, that's destroying the wetland. So the wetland no longer exists, it's the destruction, violating even the most basic right of a wetland to exist, to be that is authorized under environmental laws. And we've lost peatlands and wetlands all over the world because of development interests, getting government authority, government license under environmental laws to fill in and then destroy those wetlands or peatlands. There's all sorts of examples of this from mining and offshore oil drilling um, and you know, industrial hog farming and other kinds of activities that we license corporations, industries to carry out 
under our environmental laws. All of those laws are legalizing the use of nature, the exploitation of nature, putting certain conditions on it, certainly, but putting in place these laws that authorize that environmental harm to take place. And of course, the consequences of that, of treating nature as property, as a commodity that can be traded as an it or a thing, those consequences are severe. And I think we're all seeing them not only in daily newspaper headlines and online, but also in our day-to-day -day lives now. Um, and we're seeing the consequences of treating nature as a thing, as property, essentially as existing for human use. Those consequences are severe. And we see this, for example, these are just a few examples that I pulled out um, to show that, you know, studies are increasingly showing, research is increasingly showing that we're facing ecosystem collapse. One terrible example are coral reefs, which all over the globe are beginning to bleach and die off and disappear. Um, and this is just one example, World Resources Institute saying they could disappear by, you know, within 80 years from now. Species extinction. Um, I think we probably all know about reports that we're in the sixth great extinction um, event on planet Earth, this time caused by human activity, and that we have a million species already facing extinction. Extinction rates are far, far beyond what is a natural background extinction rate today. Um, and species all over the globe are disappearing, again, because of human activity. And of course, climate change. Um, you know, the last essentially 10 years have been the hottest in recorded human history. And that's just continuing. Um, and I think the heat waves across the United States, across Europe, across India and other places are, you know, very, very clear indications that, you know, this debate is, you know, how severe is climate change? Climate change is very, very severe and been caused by our humankind's industrial activities. We're having fundamental shifts in the natural systems around the globe because of human activity. And this has all occurred under these many thousands of environmental laws that we have in place around the world. These environmental laws are legalizing environmental harm. So we, as much as we think about environmental laws as protective, they're actually very exploitive and the consequences are very severe. So what do we do? Within the rights of nature movement, we've identified this as we need to address the root causes of why we're in these overlapping environmental crises that we face around the globe. And so this need to address root causes of how we treat nature under the law, how we govern ourselves toward nature. Environmental laws um, very much treat nature as this infinite resource that exists to serve humankind, that we are just here to control it, to use it, exploit it, to serve our own interests and needs. And as a result, we legalize that under environmental laws. And as we've seen, nature is really quite at the brink. Um, and so we need to address the root cause. We need to, number one, change how we treat nature itself under the law. Right now, it's being treated as a thing, as an it, as a property or commerce. We need to change it from this place that it doesn't even have the most basic right to exist, to even be. So nature is without legal rights today in much of the world and transform it in becoming rights bearing. Legal rights being that highest form of protection that we have in human written law. So not only recognize that nature possesses legal rights within our laws, within our court rulings, but also then change how we human beings govern ourselves toward the natural world to respect those rights, to uphold those rights, to guarantee those rights and change our own decision-making, our own actions to ensure that they align and uphold those legal rights. And so that means we need a new system of environmental law that guarantees these rights and moves nature into a protected status as a rights holder, a rights bearing living entity and transition away from treating nature as property or as an it to becoming a rights bearing entity, living entity that we respect and that nature has those rights in order that it can be healthy, it can be robust, and it can be resilient. And the good news is, is that this is already beginning to happen in different parts of the world. So with my colleague, Thomas Lindsay, who helped found my organization, we've been working on developing and advancing rights of nature laws um, since 
2006 when the first law um, was developed. And so the question now is, okay, we understand what is the rights of nature, why we need rights of nature, where is it now happening? Where is it in the law? Um, and so the first place, and this is sort of surprising for many, is that the first place that passed, adopted a rights of nature law was in a rural community in the state of Pennsylvania in the eastern part of the United States. Thomas Lindsay, my colleague, developed that law working with the people of Tamaqua Borough, that's the name of the community, which passed this first rights of nature law in 2006. And the reason that they passed this law was because there were PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, that were going to be dumped into the community. And they're very toxic. Um, and they were to be filling in um, old mines and so on. And the community looked to existing environmental laws to protect them from having these toxins dumped into their community. And they didn't find any remedy there. They didn't find any protection there under existing environmental laws. Why is that? Because existing environmental laws actually legalized the dumping of PCBs and other contaminants into their community. Finding no remedy or solution under existing environmental laws in order to protect themselves, their families, their communities, their drinking water, they essentially took themselves out from under that system of environmental law that treats nature as this it, this thing without legal rights, this thing that can be dumped upon. They took themselves out from under that and worked with Thomas to develop the first rights of nature law to recognize that nature even has the most basic right to exist. So that first law adopted by a local community in the United States, that was adopted in 2006. Since then, um, in the last 15 years or so, more than 30 communities across the United States have put into place rights of nature laws, including, as we see here, Lafayette, Colorado in 2017. They were facing fracking coming into the community, which is happening all across the state of Colorado in the Western United States. And so they established rights of nature law, local law, that recognizes that not only people have a right to a healthy climate, but also that nature possesses the right to a healthy climate, which fracking is not um, harmonious with. And so they banned fracking as a violation of the rights of nature, of the right to a healthy climate. The most recent rights of nature law at the local level to be passed in the United States was adopted by the people of Orange County in the state of Florida in the south, southeastern part of the country to recognize rights of the Waikiva River and other waterways within that community. This is the largest place in the United States to adopt a rights of nature law. Nearly 1.5 million people live there. Um, Orange County is where Disney World is, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so this is a place that is seeing all sorts of harm occurring to waterways and to waters within the state of Florida, including with the Everglade wetlands. Um, you know, you have blue green algae and red tide and other interference with the waterways and the quality of water. And they went ahead and adopted a right of waters, right of waterways law at the local level, in this case, a place with over a million people. And that occurred in 2020. Ecuador has been mentioned in 2008. Ecuador was drafting a new constitution, and we were invited to meet with delegates to their constituent assembly that was drafting this new constitution. At the time, Tamaco Borough, as I mentioned in 2006, had adopted their local law. There were a few other local rights of nature laws in place. Two years later, 2008, we began having conversation with the delegates who were drafting this new constitution. And to our surprise and pleasure, they built in the rights of nature into their national constitutional framework. The first country in the world to enshrine the rights of nature within a constitutional uh, document. And so just quickly what it says, they built this new chapter into their constitution, chapter seven, and it's article 71, opens with nature or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and occurs, has the right to integral respect for its existence, for its maintenance and regeneration of its life cycle, structures, functions, and evolutionary processes. And the next article, nature has the right to be restored. So this is the first country, the only country to put it into a national constitutional framework. But since 2008, um, other countries have established rights of nature within law. So Bolivia, a rights of mother earth law, New Zealand has passed several laws through its parliament 
that have been negotiated settlements with the Maori indigenous peoples to recognize rights of ecosystems, such as the Wanganui River, as an autonomous entity ecosystem with certain legal rights. Uganda amended its National Environmental Act in 2019 to bring in the rights of nature. Panama, earlier this year, passed a rights of nature law. So there's our national laws, but there's also subnational, state and provincial level kinds of laws and local laws. Of course, the first rights of nature laws were local laws and those continue to be passed. So we see here, Brazil, local communities now have passed rights of nature laws. In Mexico, at the state level, there are rights of nature laws. In Australia, um, the first vote um, in there has occurred at a local level news in Blue Mountains Council, New South Wales, uh, just recently to put in place a rights of nature motion or resolution. Last year in Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, two district councils adopted these rights of nature resolutions to think about how do we begin to build the rights of nature into our operations, into our government actions. And also last year, um, a local council in the province of Quebec adopted a ecosystem law, a rights of the Magpie River law. So we're seeing at the local level and even higher up subnationally, laws are being established to recognize the rights of nature in different parts of the world under different kinds of um, legal frameworks, under different kinds of cultures, societies, different kinds of legal systems. The rights of nature is advancing at national levels, subnational, and even local levels. And First Nations as well are beginning to advance rights of nature laws into their laws and policies. Um, and so within the United States, the White Earth Band of Ojibwe, part of the Chippewa Nation um, and the central Midwest part of the country adopted a rights of Minoman or wild rice law within, in, within their community. Um, and that is the first time that we have a law recognizing the rights of a particular plant species. The Ponca tribe of Oklahoma in 2018, the Yurok tribe in Northern California recognizing rights of the Klamath River, which flows through their tribal lands. The Menominee tribe are recognized rights of the Menominee River. Nez Perce recognized rights of the Snake River. Um, the Innu Council um, alongside um, the community, the non-Indigenous community in Quebec recognizing rights of the Magpie River. The Indigenous Innu Council also recognized rights of the Magpie River um, within Quebec. And so you're seeing these laws and policy being moved into First Nation law and policies as well in different parts of the world. And in conversations, as we do this work uh, with First Nations, so much of the conversation is that this concept of rights of nature, that nature is a relative, um, that nature has rights that need to be respected. While it's very new idea to much of the Western world, for First Nations, they say it's not new, it's ancient. It's a return to how we've always lived, um, recognizing nature as a relative, as a mother, um, as a father, um, as part of our culture, as part of our people. And so this First Nations moving in this direction to protect the rights of nature within their written laws is really about bringing their cultural frameworks, how they've lived within their lands into these written documents for the first time. So as I mentioned, rights of nature have been recognized within laws in different parts of the world, but also through certain court decisions. Um, and court decisions at national constitutional levels and even, even at state levels. Um, and so here are just a selection of these. Um, in Colombia, their constitutional court, their highest court, recognized rights of Rio Atrato, a river um, that's been heavily damaged um, by mining in which indigenous communities live within. Um, the court essentially found that existing environmental laws within Colombia didn't provide the kind of protection that the river needed, was failing to protect that river ecosystem um, and look beyond the borders of Colombia to see what was happening within the international legal sphere and came across rights of nature and brought that into Colombia. Colombia does not have an underlying rights of nature law at the national level. And so they found, declared that Rio Atrato possesses certain legal rights. The first time that we've seen a court actually do that recognizing that an ecosystem has certain rights, even though there is no underlying law that they're interpreting, they're actually finding that it does and that those rights need to be respected and protected and certain activities need to be implemented in order to guarantee and uphold these rights. 
India, we've had a number of court cases there now in which courts, state courts, such as in this case, have recognized rights of ecosystems and species. Um, this high court, state court, recognized for the first time that the Ganges or Mother Ganga and the Amuna rivers and tribu other tributaries and ecosystems possess legal rights. Another case in Colombia that occurred in 2018, their Supreme Court below the Constitutional Court recognized that within the Colombian Amazonian region that the Amazon possesses legal rights. Bangladesh court cases being brought in 2019, their Supreme Court declared that all rivers within that country possess legal rights. So this is another mechanism by which ecosystem species are being recognized as possessing legal rights. So there's lawmaking, there are court decisions, both recognizing rights of nature. And so quickly, um, this idea that nature has legal rights, as I mentioned, key elements of rights of nature laws, the ability to exercise or enforce these rights. Um, and the question, you know, has this happened? Um, and so Ecuador is very much at the forefront of this. They've had their constitution in place already um, since 2008. And so there have been a number of cases um, that have gone through the courts there, local provincial courts, all the way up to their constitutional court. And these are just a few examples. And what's really critical in understanding this is that this stuff kind of evolves. When I say stuff, I mean this recognition of rights, this enshrinement within their constitution and in other frameworks in other countries, it takes time to evolve. It's one thing to have a law passed or a constitution promulgated. It's another to interpret that and have the courts understand what to do with this to properly interpret and enforce these rights. And so cases have been brought in the name of ecosystems, in the name of species, to enforce their legal rights under their national constitution. The Vilcabamba River case you may have heard of in 2011, it's the first case that was decided in which there was road construction happening, dumping of road fill within the river, interfering with the health and flow of the river. And a case was brought that the rights of the river were being violated under their constitutional rights of nature framework and the court agreed. The Marmesa case is another example of a case being um, brought constitutional court upheld the decision by a lower court in which the rights of these fragile mangrove ecosystem was being violated by shrimp farming, which essentially clears out the mangroves, which are really critical um, ecosystems on coastlines uh, within Ecuador and, and all over the world, um, and found that it violated the rights of nature to have shrimp farming occur that would destroy these mangrove ecosystem, even their basic right to exist, of course. Last year, 2021, we had a really landmark case um, for the Los Cedros Protected Forest, where exploratory mining was already being authorized by the government. Um, and a case was brought and, and we provided friend of the court or amicus briefs, um, some of which the court adopted in its ruling in that the drilling mining within a fragile ecosystem, which the Los Cedros Forest is, and within habitat of at-risk species, which the forest also is, that mining within that would violate the rights of those ecosystems, would violate the rights of those species and prohibited banned mining from taking place in fragile ecosystems and the habitat of at-risk species because it would violate those. It, you may be familiar, there's a, mining is a very um, lucrative industry within Ecuador. And so having the constitutional court rule that the rights of nature need to be protected and that mining cannot occur in these places was a big, big decision for the court to make. And it told you just how protected and important it is that the rights are enshrined within their national constitution. And so that was a landmark case. And the last piece of this slide in that lower right-hand corner, I, I'm, I'll just tell you that as you see the courts kind of get their minds around what does it mean that nature has constitutional rights within Ecuador, we see that the courts have you know, just started their decision-making, their deliberations to number one, affirm, to positively say, yes, nature possesses those legal rights for the very first time. No, it hasn't happened anywhere else. Um, secondly, that people, individuals, people within Ecuador are able to go into court on behalf of and in the name of nature to enforce the rights that nature holds that are being infringed or harmed. That we see that the rights of nature is now radiating out into different kinds of law, criminal law, civil law, operational kinds of laws, um, and that it applies nationwide. 
Um, that's important because in the Los Cedros case that I mentioned from last year in that ruling, the court said, yes, the rights of nature are being violated if mining occurs in a fragile ecosystem or in the habitat of at-risk species. And that's a clear violation of rights of nature. But the rights of nature are not limited to these places that are fragile and um, that provide habitat for at-risk species. Rights of nature applies everywhere. Um, and that's important because you want to ensure that a place doesn't have to get to a critical you know, crisis state or a uh, species doesn't have to get to a crisis state before the rights of nature kicks in, that those rights apply all the time nationwide. This is one example of it, but that it applies all the time everywhere and that the government needs to respect it, which is part of the reason we're working with their national assembly, their national legislature or parliament to build in rights of nature decision-making criteria into just their day-to-day -day environmental laws to ensure they're not infringing upon the rights of nature. So we have court cases and there have been several still that are ongoing within the United States. I mentioned uh, the rights of Monoman or wild rice that the White Earth um, Tribal Nation Band has brought into their tribal court now to enforce those rights against a pipeline um, that's being built and operating that comes very close to tribal lands and requires 5 billion gallons of water to construct and operate that line. Um, and so that's a violation of the rights of the wild rice, which depends upon freshwater habitat. Within their rights of nature law, they have a right to habitat, a right to fresh water, because that's what it needs to exist and to thrive as a species. So there are other, other cases. I just cited these from Ecuador because it's the most developed. It's had this national framework in place now um, for over a decade. And so the final piece before we open up for discussion and questions I wanted to just discuss is we're here to talk about peatlands. So what does it mean to apply the rights of nature to peatlands? So this idea of advancing the rights of peatlands, first, the question is the mechanism, how to do that? And as um, I hope has been illustrated by this presentation, rights of nature laws can be passed through a local ordinance, a local bylaw, it can be passed at a state or a higher level than that, at a provincial level, at a state level, and it can be passed within national laws. So thinking about getting our minds around recognizing the rights of peatlands, we can think about it from an ecosystem approach, the recognizing right of a particular peatland within a particular community, or perhaps within a province, or perhaps even nationally recognizing rights of all peatlands within a national legal framework. So there's different places where this can move forward and thinking about how do we recognize these rights within law. And the second piece of course is what rights are we recognizing? Um, and so sort of basic common elements of most rights of nature laws in the second part of this slide, we see you know, those basic rights, the right even to exist, um, the right to thrive, the right to regenerate, the right to evolve, the right of a peatland to perform its natural functions as an ecosystem the right of it to be restored should it be harmed. So those are sort of common rights that are very commonly found in rights of nature laws that you know, can really be applied to most of nature ecosystems and species. But then there's also particular rights that are particular to particular ecosystem or particular species. I mentioned the wild rice, which depends upon freshwater habitat and that right was recognized within that rights of wild rice law passed by white earth. With peatlands, specific needs of peatlands in order to be healthy and thriving and robust, what are those specific rights to begin to think about? Certainly a right to fresh water and a right to not be drained or filled in. So a right to continue to exist by prohibiting certain activities that would interfere with even that basic right to exist. There's certainly more than that, but I wanted to provide sort of a beginning to think about okay, we wanna have basic rights of peatlands recognized, whether in a local, sub-national or national law or legal framework, but also what are those rights that we want to recognize? Um, well, how do we begin to define them? And so that I just wanted to give a sense of what those could look like, those basic rights that nature needs to be healthy and thriving, but also rights specific to the ecosystem, a peatland ecosystem, certainly freshwater being part of that, certainly not being drained, a right to not be drained as part of that are really key um, if we're to protect the rights of peatlands. 
So I'll finish there. I want to say thank you um, to Repeat and everyone who brought this together, for all of you for participating and um, coming to this session. Again, my organization, we very happy to participate in any efforts that go forward. We do all sorts of work in terms of legislative drafting and legal research, meeting with elected officials and doing education and trainings. Um, so we're happy to do that. Welcome anybody to contact us um, after this session, after the conference. Really excited to be able to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was a wonderful, very comprehensive overview. Um, I would now suggest we can go on to some Q&A. And so you're welcome to put questions in the chat. I see Bianca's right in there with one. <laughs> um, or you can also put up your hand. Um, so I'll just start with Bianca. I also have a few questions as well, but let's see how it goes. I can start with all of yours first. Um, so Bianca was asking whether you can speak about the process of tailoring a right to peatland or another ecosystem or plant to the local ecology, indigenous, indigenous knowledge or wisdom? Yes, I think it's really important to think about rights of nature, that these are not, rights of nature laws are not just, you know, a template that you just bring into your community or your country. It really has to be tailored specifically to the place. And that's really important to the local culture, the local relationship, to the landscape, to the ecosystem, um, and building in the local knowledge and indigenous knowledge about the needs of that ecosystem in order to properly protect it. It can be landscape specific, you know, climatically specific. Is this part of a larger peatland ecosystem? All of those things become considerations for developing a rights of peatlands law, uh, law, whether locally or at a higher level. So yes, I mean, these laws are very much specific to place. Um, there are key elements, as I mentioned, you know, basic rights, the ability to enforce those rights and implement those rights. But that's just sort of the outline of a rights of nature law. Otherwise, they become very specific to the relationship, the culture, the how people live within an ecosystem, and often can include the rights of people as well. For example, you know, recognizing the right of peatland, of a peatland ecosystem, but also the right of the people to a healthy peatland ecosystem, recognizing that we are very much a part of the ecosystems. We're very much a part of nature and dependent on nature. Can I ask a follow-up to your response? Is that all right? Please. Um, I'm not sure if you know, but has there been any case where this type of uh, consideration wasn't integrated in the process? Uh, I know like the cases are kind of limited, but um, yeah, like if so, uh, the local ecology wasn't integrated uh, in this declaration or if the indigenous wisdom wasn't um, like used as the framework or something like that. Well, um, I can't think of a specific instance, but I know that there has been um, tensions, certainly within the environmental movement in general around the world. But also, I know that we do a, quite a bit of work um, with First Nations, with Indigenous peoples, um, and they have a lot of questions about the rights of nature. You know, is this a Western framework that's being forced upon them? And so we have this very you know, deep kind of conversation discussion about what it is, why it is, is it appropriate for their legal system or not? Um, and if they determine that it is, how does it become something that really is reflective of who they are, of their language, of their history, of their relationship with the ecosystem or the species that they are seeking to protect? So that is for us a very deep and ongoing conversation. It's not something that you know, happens very quickly, actually. It's something that takes time. Um, and for many, particularly First Nations within the United States, where we've done a significant amount of work, it is a conversation that requires thinking about the kind of ongoing trauma that First Nations are experiencing and how law has been used as an instrument against First Nation people, against Indigenous peoples, not just in the United States, but very much in the United States, and how do they begin to use the law to develop their own laws um, that can be used to protect so that it's no longer a tool of exploitation, not only against them, but of nature, and that they're able to actually build this in to their own 
legal frameworks in a way that is protective, that is reflective of their relationship with the natural world. Okay, perfect. So I will read first Katie's question and then Philip, if you wanted to ask your one. Uh, so first Katie was just wondering if you've seen any rights to peatlands declarations already. No, I haven't. I will say, however, um, that part of, not specific to peatlands, but part of the law, for instance, in Orange County, Florida, passed in 2020, recognizing rights of waterways, that includes wetlands. Um, and there has been a case that's been brought into court within Florida in which the wetlands, or excuse me, the waterways themselves that are being proposed for development that would fill in the wetlands and therefore destroy them. So they no longer would even have that right to exist. That case has been moving through court within the state of Florida. So the first time that we're seeing this effort to enforce the rights of waterways, including wetlands, occurring within the United States, um, but it's the first time I'm seeing that happen really anywhere. Uh, okay, great. And uh, Philip, I will pass over to you now if you would like to unmute and ask your question. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we've got loads of questions, but let me maybe <laughs> point it down to the to the most important one. Um, now, if, if there is no right of law uh, enacted in the countries, for example, we have the problem, we're working on the consumer market for peat products in the Netherlands, and now the Netherlands doesn't have that, Latvia didn't pop up, this would be as or, or all the Baltic countries, which are the source of origin of the peat that we're using in the Netherlands. If both countries don't have these laws, um, can we do something about it? And I did think in terms of a shell type uh, lawsuit, but would that even be applicable as far as I understand your talk? Right of nature is a different sort of direction than what the shell uh, case from Milieu Central was, was uh, aiming for. Right. Um, so there ha you're, you're quite right. Those countries that you've mentioned do not have rights of nature or rights of peatland laws in place. Um, I know that in my conversations with folks within repeat part of this conference is thinking about are there places within Europe or in other parts of the world that we want to begin working with people within the community or within a country to develop a law to propose a law and advance it to adoption and enactment which to me is a very exciting prospect um, and so hopefully that will develop going to court to have a peatland ecosystem recognized as possessing rights, that's a difficult path. These are all difficult paths. I don't mean to suggest that lawmaking is easy, um, but when you're asking a court to find a certain right, you want, you're want you looking at existing law or legal system within a particular country. Is there something within law in which we can find that nature, for example, possesses legal rights, something that already exists that we can draw on to protect nature? That's a difficult task. Um, it's not a pathway that I would necessarily recommend. I think that recognizing rights of peatlands within a local law or a higher level of law within a country is probably the path I would choose. And one of the key pieces, of course, is, you know, is building, you know, an understanding that peatlands are very, very much at risk um, and that they're critical ecosystems for all of the reasons I think people in this, in this conference participating are no. And so I think that the lawmaking piece, whether it begins locally or moves up higher to a national level, is really key to being able to begin to protect the rights of peatlands within Europe and in other places. Mm -hmm. And with, within one country, I mean, I, I can lobby in the Netherlands, but I would have a very hard time to do that in Latvia. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if one of the... Get, if you would get Sorry. to the point to have some level of protection in the Netherlands, could that then be like... Uh, extracted to, to goods that we import from other countries. That could be built into the law, yes. So for instance, and I'm just, you know, just um, brainstorming here, but one of the pieces of a right of peatlands law could include that any imported goods that include peat um, within their product, that they have to be sourced 
from peatlands that are being protected under the same similar similar you know framework um or you know somehow either certifying a way to certify that or from a country or a place that has a also has a rights of peatlands law in place there's different ways to develop those kinds of provisions but i think it would focus on setting certain criteria to ensure that the rights of peatlands are being guaranteed or upheld to the same level with the netherlands as in latvia or somewhere else um, and that you know that's something that you explore and you work through as you develop that law but yes you can absolutely build that into a rights of peatlands um legal framework cool thank you very much Okay, so I'll read another question that we have in the chat from Harriet, who was asking, how can we balance the tensions between historical rights of local residents to use peatland resources, so for example, for heating homes, and the rights of peatlands to be healthy? That's an excellent question. Um, and let's think about this in a broader term to respond, which is right now on a global scale, we know that we are interfering with the very basic natural systems of the earth, species, habitat, coral reefs, climate. I mean, we've affected every part of this, of the, the natural world of the earth. We've interfered with it. And we know that our actions are interfering with the ability of nature to be healthy, to be robust, to be resilient. Um, and so that's where the rights of nature comes in. The question becomes, um, can we protect peatlands, you know, let's say in a local community, Harriet's community, um, can we do that in a way such that people can still depend upon peatlands um, and take it for fuel or, or whatever else the need is, but do that taking from the peatlands in a way that doesn't interfere with the health and well being of that peatland ecosystem? So, is there a balance and building that into the law so that you're not, the idea of the rights of nature isn't that we, you know, stop all development, stop all human activity. Obviously, that's neither practical or going to happen. The question is, how do we bring our human actions, our government decision makings into line with a way that protects nature as opposed to exploits it? So with a local peatland ecosystem, what do we need to do? Not only recognize the rights of that ecosystem, but what do we need to do to ensure that our human activity is not interfering with the ability of that ecosystem to be healthy? And how do like, so what are, what sort of limits, for example, what sort of decision-making do we need to put in place to ensure that we continue to uphold the rights of that ecosystem, not interfere with its well-being and meet human needs? That's part of sort of the journey and exploration that these laws undergo is to figure out how do we make them not only protective, but ensure that that protection remains in place in perpetuity and that we human being, our activity is interfering. And so that's part of the journey of making these laws work. So it's a very, very good question. We get those sorts of questions a lot. Um, and so it's a question of how do we do that in a way that's both protective and not exploitive, but also ensures that the people within the community have the ability to meet their own needs. But Harriet, I hope that answers your question. If not, you can also add another thought in the chat. Okay, so fine. Um, does anyone else have? Oh, Philip, go for it. You can have as many as you want. <laughs> no, but what, what what I anticipate as a counter argument uh, would be that uh, the peat lobby would then just say it's already degraded, uh, it's already drained, and we're just digging out a little bit of peat, and then we restore it. Um, how would it be best to counter that argument under a rights of nature law and without that? Right. Okay. So in general, um, the fact that something is degraded doesn't mean that we should degrade it more. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and restoring these kinds of ecosystems is really difficult. And um, it's a process and it occurs over a long period of time to bring it back to a healthy, vibrant, thriving state. Um, and so a rights of nature law can not only recognize rights, but it can also prohibit or ban activities that would violate those rights. So for instance, um, again, just brainstorming what it could include, it could conclude you know, the right of peatlands to be healthy and thriving and to exist, a right to fresh water, a right to not be drained, and then put in a prohibition on those kinds of activities that you just described, that industrial or corporate use 
of a peatland prohibiting that activity. It could also include this right to be restored. We often think about the right of nature to be restored um, as sort of, well, if something happens and the rights are violated, then they have to bring it back to a whole undamaged state. But there's also that proactive piece. So if you're already recognizing rights of peatlands and have deteriorated peatlands, the government then has a proactive requirement mandate to restore those peatlands. And so it could include both a prohibition on activities that violate the rights of the peatlands, but also a requirement upon government to restore those peatlands that have already been degraded in order to guarantee that the rights of the peatlands are being met. And without the uh, rights of peatland provision, would there be any uh, direction one, one could take? Well, uh, not being familiar with the lo laws within the place that you're talking about, I mean, you could look to see if government has exceeded its authority or corporations have exceeded their authority in taking from these degraded peatlands. I don't know if those sorts of protections are in place. I'm guessing not, given what you've described. Um, but it's a question that we continue to treat peatlands as these, you know, natural resource to be exploited and, and taken from as opposed to protected. Um, and so whether there are laws in place, I couldn't say, um, but it is something as part of the work to develop rights of nature laws is looking what existing laws already are in place. Can you build upon any of those? Often you have to just build a new rights of nature law altogether, but hopefully build on an existing foundation which build support for it as well within your legislator or parliament. Okay, so I just, I recognize we're now at seven. I was wondering if, oh, my time anyway, um, whether there's still a few more questions. I see Ian put one in and whether, Mary, you have a few extra minutes to Certainly. kind of round up some math questions. Okay, so Ian, I wonder if maybe you wanted to uh, say your question just in case there's some more background that you want to give. Uh, but Ian was asking about recognizing time scale. So, for example, an 8,000 year old peatland. Oh, I see. So, if I understand the question, the question being can we protect older peatlands versus newer peatlands? Is that the question? Yeah, maybe Ian, you can just clarify quickly, either in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and uh, clarify a little bit. Yeah. So basically, what I'm trying to get at is if you're looking for some level of uh, balance with exploitation uh, being permitted as part of human need, uh, but having a, a, an ecosystem that might not actually reach its full potential for 8,000 years, how are we actually going to know that that's the case now? Okay. Um, well, if you recognize rights of peatlands, let's assume like there's a national law to protect the rights of peatlands in France, for instance. All peatlands, I guess you could decide within that law if you're going to treat different peatlands differently based on size, based on location, based on age, um, you could choose to do that. Um, and that's a possibility to say that we're only going to, be, if we're going to be allowing any kind of exploitation of peatlands, number one, that exploitation cannot, you know, that activity cannot interfere with the health and well being of that peatland, but that we're also not going to be um, exploiting or taking from a peatland that has not reached its full life cycle, if you will. You know, you can draw a parallel um, with certain fishing laws in which you can't um, fish smaller fish or juvenile or younger fish, you can only take or harvest an adult. Um, for instance, and, you know, and certain fishing laws have that in place. I think we could think about that as a parallel to, well, maybe we only are allowed, if we're going to take it all from any peatland under a rights of peatlands law, that we can only do that for those that are fully essentially realized within their process of development. Um, that's a question that could be explored um, in the development of a rights of nature, rights of peatlands law. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 get, I get the argument, but I think that it's uh, very, very complicated. <laughs> and it I, is, I, I look at yeah. it in the concept of the European Habitats Directive yeah. as its own definition as to what its favorable condition actually is. But I think that another generation, I'm talking of someone who's retired, and I know how much 
people's views of ecology have changed in my working life, uh, I expect they will carry on evolving and who am I to see which of us were right. Um, okay, I'm going to pass first to Irene then, um, and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you so much, Mary, for the overview. Um, I was wondering if you have any reflections on like the sort of post law acceptance phase of rights of nature, um, any situations that you would like to highlight in which um, this law has indeed has had sort of like a protective effect uh, and cases perhaps where the law has just been it was in place but completely ignored or maybe like surpassed by another conflicting law um, and if you have any sort of from the top of your head stats of like how effective in reality a right of nature approach is to nature conservation yeah thank you for that question so just two examples quickly um, so in the United States, where we have a number of local communities that have passed local ordinances or bylaws recognizing the rights of nature, most of those local laws also include a prohibition on certain activities, such as fracking, for instance, understanding that fracking would be a violation, automatic violation of the rights of nature. It's incompatible with the health and well-being of nature to frack or industrial um, water bottling, which has been another issue that communities in the United States and I know elsewhere around the world have dealt with. And so there are places that have rights of nature laws in place where the prohibition on a certain industrial activity has been built into those laws. And where we have that, we haven't had the fracking occur. We haven't had the industrial water bottling operations occur. And in fact, in a place in the state of Maine, um, the communities of Shapley and Newfield, which past rights of nature laws that prohibit industrial um, water siphoning for water bottling, you know, the Nestle Corporation pulled out of those communities as a result of that law. Um, so we see that. And then you also have in Ecuador um, within their constitutional framework, their rights of nature constitutional provisions, those don't contain specific prohibitions on activities, but now the courts are finding that the rights of nature as a constitutional protection requires prohibition on certain activities. I mentioned the Los Cedros case from last year in which the court, constitutional court determined that because the rights of nature are in place within Ecuador, mining cannot occur in a fragile ecosystem, cannot occur in habitat of at-risk species. So it's a prohibition founding by the court in order to guarantee that those rights continue to be upheld. So we're seeing it happen in different places in different ways, which I think is really important to understand that this is not all, you know, move from A to B to C to Z, that it can occur in different ways, which helps to sort of open up our minds about the possibilities of how do we protect nature in this way. And nice comment from uh, Ian. Thank you, everyone, for your very stimulated, very stimulated ideas. I feel very challenged. But um does anyone have any final questions um you can i can also pass to philip if he has another one but maybe if anyone else has another one as our final kind of question you can go ahead yeah i had just had a brief question um oh yeah, well, sorry I, Bianca, I, I oh yeah i was just wondering if uh maybe it's like, would it be an idea to generally declare the rights of nature and then focus in on a specific type of ecosystem to like supplement uh, its protection or has that been done before? Or is that like an idea that's feasible? That's an excellent question. And it really depends on the place that you're thinking about trying to advance a law. Some places as in Ecuador, you know, nature on the whole possesses legal rights, um, constitutional rights. In other places, um, specific ecosystems have been recognized like a river as holding rights. It really depends on the circumstances, wherever it is you're thinking about moving a law. Number one, you know, is there a particular threat to a particular ecosystem or species? Is it integral, for instance, um, to First Nations like the white earth? Wild rice is deeply important to them, not only as a food, but as a cultural uh, matter as well. Um, so it really depends on what's very important to the people within a place, 
that are looking to do this? Is there a particular threat um, to a particular ecosystem or species? And what, you know, in practical terms, what's going to mobilize people to build support to have a law passed to recognize nature on the whole or a specific ecosystem? I think it's important to understand that by recognizing rights of a particular ecosystem, that can have broad effects, obviously, but also that it really is a stepping stone to recognize the rights of all of nature. So what is possible? That's the key question. What is possible where you are? Um, and what's the level of protection that you can build? Because it just at an ecosystem level, which is a big deal. Could it be nature on the whole or species specific or nature on the whole? It really just depends on what you want to do, what people are mobilized to protect, what's practically politically within the place that you're thinking about um, and moving from there. Those are key questions I would ask myself um, in taking the first steps on this campaign. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I got rid of you too fast there, Bianca, the spotlight. Um, okay, let's do one final question from Philip, if that's okay, and then we will um, kind of close the session. So Philip was asking what are the typical do's and don'ts of getting a rights of nature law passed? That's a big question. Um, I think it's really important, right, to, you know, we're having this conversation in this conference, I think it's very reflective of uh, rights of nature being understood more, um, but it's really still a very new idea in the world. And so that one of the first things I would do, a very important do, um, is for yourself, for your local group, maybe, I don't know if it's your, you know, government officials, whomever it is that's going to be engaged in this, I think education is really, really important to really understand what this is. You know, the key questions that we get all the time is, why do we need to do this when we have millions of environmental laws? Why is this necessary? Can't we just make those a little bit better? Why do we need to go in this direction? Understanding why this is necessary and being able to respond to that is really critical for a successful campaign. So I think that sort of internal education is really important and that's something we do all the time with different groups and government officials all over the world. Doing that deep understanding. Um, finding out, um, I think really important is finding out what's really important within the place that you live. Is it a river? Is it a species? Is it nature on the whole? So what do you think is really going to mobilize people to help build support for that? And then the other piece I think is really important um, is spending the time, I mean, it's, I think we have, we live, you know, I know in the United States, this is true. We live in a culture of kind of immediacy and that we want things to happen, you know, very, very quickly. And why can't it happen that fast? You know, it's an urgent need to protect nature. I completely agree. I feel that urgency. I think we all do here. But taking the time to really engage the communities you need to engage um, within, again, the place that you're looking to pass a law is really important to build that support. I mean, one of the questions earlier was about, you know, tensions or, you know, our First Nations or Indigenous peoples being engaged in this, you want to make sure that that happens, that the people who are going to be impacted, who have a deep relationship with the natural world, are part of that conversation. Um, and so those are some of the, I guess, a do and don't um, all at once. But I think that internal understanding, those internal learnings, to me, is really the first step, because this is not an easy journey. People are taking this journey not necessarily because they want to, but because they need to, um, because they understand the existing environmental legal frameworks are simply not able to protect nature in the way that nature needs to be protected. And so they're moving in this new direction, but it's not a direction that's an easy path to follow. So having your feet, you know, firmly understanding what you're doing, why you're doing it, why existing environmental laws aren't up to the task, I think is really critical in taking that first step. 